you heavens above, rain down my righteousness, let your clouds shower it down, let the earth open wide, let salvation spring up, let righteousness flourish with it. I, the Lord, have created it. Welcome to Fairmount. I'm so glad you're here. Let's worship together this morning, possibly, maybe, hold on. Have you guys ever had that day? Is it today? Every day. <laughs> oh my goodness.
things going on today, let's open with a word of prayer. Father God, be with us this morning that we hear your words spoken, that we see you move in this place. Um, Father, and then we can be your presence in this world and in our community. Thank you for bringing us together. We know it's not by accident. We know we're here for a purpose. Uh, so show us that today in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to allow you for just a moment to take a seat. And if you would, direct your attention to the baptistry where we get to watch amazing this morning. All right. Well, good morning. Good morning. I am so excited this morning to introduce you to uh, Sophia and Ezra Robinson, and uh, they are here this morning uh, to be baptized into Christ, and uh, I'm just so excited for both of them, and uh, this is just an exci- a great day for both of you, so uh, congratulations, and uh, I've, known, I've known them for a little while. Holly's known them for a long time, so my wife's known them for a long time, and we're just thrilled to have you being baptized into Christ this morning. So as we, as we talked about earlier, uh, we're going to do a confession of faith, and so I'm going to have you just repeat it together after me, okay? So, I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son of the, living God, the Son of the living God, and I take him, and I take him to be the King of my life. To be the King of my life. Amen. So here we're going we're gonna to do you first. So Ezra, I'm going to have you back up here a little bit. Okay. So, Sophia, based on your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of eternal life. All right, Ezra, based on your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life. That's amazing. I love watching that. Um, lots of things going on. I want to bring them to your attention before, uh, before you forget. And everything is outside. You've got a bulletin. It's got stuff going on. I know you're all getting ready to sign up. Some of you I see pulling out your pens right now to sign up for stuff. That's awesome. Here's what I want you to remember. Uh, the Fearless, Fearless Women's Ministry, it's coming up quick. They need to know if you're going and you need to be there. It's really going to be amazing. Um, the, everybody in the family is invited to go watch the squirrels play baseball this week. It's going to be a blast. I hope you're able to do that. Tickets are not very expensive. Uh, head out there and we can all go and eat popcorn and uh, yell at umpires. It's, it's a godly thing. It is. Um, and then last but not least, uh, um, life groups are starting. Now, some of you get life groups. Some of you have done life groups. Some of you have been in a life group your whole life. You just didn't call it that. And that is amazing. But there are a lot of people that are looking for ways to connect to people that have like-minded interests and other things like that. So I want you to be able to do that. And if you're interested in finding out more information or being a part of life groups here at Fairmount, there's a booth set up out there. Seth is there. Seth will talk and talk, and he'll talk with you a little bit about life groups. So you need to go engage Seth, and he will tell you everything that is going on with life groups. So let's, let's stand up right now. I'm going to give you just three seconds to uh, wave across the aisle to somebody that you haven't had a chance to see yet this morning, and we're going to continue to worship. Testimony. 
flee at the mention of your name king of majesty there is no power in hell nor any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great i am Well, good morning again. I am so excited uh, this morning to introduce you to my friend Adam Delinsky. Uh, Adam and his wife Claudia and their uh, children are here uh, at Fairmount this Sunday. Uh, Adam is the, the pastor at the Warsaw West Church in Poland, and uh, we're going to be talking about that ministry there and, and what's going on with Ukrainian refugees. But I just want you to please help me welcome Adam to Fairmount this morning. So I've had the uh, privilege of uh, getting to really know Adam a lot better over the last year. I was in Poland in September and met with uh, his leadership team at Warsaw West Church. And then in June, our team uh, was there and uh, worked uh, with the Warsaw West Church for uh, several days, uh, one week, as they uh, helped minister to Ukrainian refugees. And so uh, Adam, their church is in a unique situation in that they meet in a shopping mall in Poland. And that, that's just not unique to Warsaw, that's unique to the whole country. And so, uh, Adam, just tell us a little bit about what it's like being in a shopping mall and what are some of the advantages of that for your church? Uh, first of all, we are so happy and, and, and glad we could be here with you and we are thrilled to have this worship time, uh, worshiping our God together with, together with our family. So, definitely, greetings from Warsaw uh, here to Fairmont. Uh, yes, the population of Poland is uh, 38 million, 
and evangelical churches are uh, 0.2 uh, percent, which means not a lot. We are minority, and we are exotic anyway. Uh, so we decided to be more exotic, and we found our venue in a shopping mall. So both s it seems very original for Polish people to have this evangelical community and being in shopping mall, so everyone is interested. We uh, draw people attention, which we really like, because then we can share gospel with them and reach out to them and share Christ's love with them. So, yes, this is a very original thing, and definitely we as a, uh, as a fellowship, when we started five years ago as a church plant, we decided our vision will be to... We, we, we're praying for Warsaw to be soaked with a uh, gospel message through healthy local churches. And we are doing it mainly through involving in local community with many different activities. And that's how we get to know people and that's how we get to serve them. And this place, actually, the, the new venue of the church is not only ours. We say, you know, church is not the building. So we're just saying them, this is a nice room you can you can use it for many different and good reasons so we can help you with that and feel invited but then sunday service is also open to you so you can hear the gospel about jesus christ yes now when i was there in september you were meeting downstairs at the mall but you were in the process of renovating a more permanent space upstairs tell me a little bit about that renovation yeah tell me about it yes ex <laughs> exactly yeah so uh <laughs> For half a year, we were uh, negotiating. For one year, we were renovating, and that was exactly COVID time. And, you know, God showed us this place, and he showed us in his... He did it in his surprising way, because we couldn't find anything else. And um, this is, as you can imagine, very challenging, and especially in COVID times. But... God gave us an architect, gave us a lawyer, gave us somebody who could negotiate. And now I have some of their competencies also. So if you need any advice, yeah, that was renovating, plastering, prices of any, yeah, even concrete, I can tell you that. I mean, they, 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 they're raising up still, but uh, yeah. Anyway, it, it was absolutely challenging for such a small fellowship as we are, 120 people. So, but God was good and helped us a lot. We're still not finished. And 12th of December last year, we were able to start the first service in our new venue. Yeah, so you moved in in December. And then in February, uh, Russia invades Ukraine and refugees start flooding into Poland. And it's your ministry flipped uh, into something entirely differently almost overnight. So you've been doing a lot of work with refugees uh, Tell us what, that's looked like, what that looks like and how it's continuing to progress as the war continues. When we just entered the venue, uh, little of my worries were about we don't have that much activities, so what about if the church would be closed every day, let's say till afternoon on something, and that what worries me because people are making, you know, they're, they're shopping and they could in, be in here but it would be closed. And now, after what happened, sometimes I think it would be nice to have less people, <laughs> sometimes, at least. And, uh, but this is actually a horrifying uh, situation, and horror happened on uh, our eastern border. Uh, as I said, 38 million of Poles and five and a half million till now Ukrainian refugees crossed our border. <laughs> in almost six months. So in almost six months, 10%, more than 10% of our population. So that's, that's amazing. That's really terrifying. It was absolutely overwhelming for everybody. But on the other hand, we see how God is moving and his like Holy Spirit movement because government has nothing to do with that. And people were helping refugees hosting them in their houses, in their homes. And you need to know that the homes in Poland are much smaller than here, rather flats, two rooms maybe. And so that is really amazing. And for us, seeing this 
and not being involved, it, it was obvious, we'll be involved, but going 100% in it was a choice. It, just one simple thing to show you what the chaos was and how fast things were changing. I just got the call that there's 160 children from Kharkiv uh, need to be relocated and, uh, the, from the orphanage and we need to find transportation and accommodation for them in Poland. It took me five minutes to find both. And when I called back, it uh, seems that we were uh, too late. There was somebody else already doing it. And I was happy they did. But uh, so, so it, it was, that was a crazy times. We cried a lot. We haven't slept a lot. My children haven't seen me. Uh, for a while, but at the end we see God is moving and he prepares us for more because it's actually a marathon. It hasn't ended. Needs hasn't ended. People still coming to Poland, 25,000 at least every day, every day. So you can imagine how much needs there are. And so there's a accommodation, food, uh, supplies, and also adaptation. Now we are going to think of, for example, what the children from Ukraine will do in September when the school year starts if there is no place in Polish schools. And 95% of people who are coming are mothers with children. So that's, for example, one more thing we have to think about. But yet, God prepared his venue for these times. So yeah, we are in his uh, will, which we like. Mm -hmm. Although we are tired. <laughs> Yeah, we were just so uh, privileged to be able to work with you when we were there. And the food distribution site that uh, Adam told me, they feed six to 7,000 people a month uh, through that. We, we worked in that uh, shelter, a shelter that, that they have, and, and where they not only house people, to help people to relocate throughout Europe. Just a lot of needs that are, that are being met. And so uh, I want to pray for Adam and his family and for uh, his congregation and for the churches in Poland and uh, that God would just continue to, to bless them and, and strengthen them during this time. Can I just say thank you? Thank sure. you for being our friends and partners in that. We really need that. And it's really wonderful to know we have friends around the world. All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you uh, so much for Adam. Thank you for Claudia and their family. Uh, Lord, thank you uh, that they're able to be with us uh, today and be in the, the, the States for a few weeks. And Lord, I just thank you so much for Adam's leadership and uh, Lord, for how his congregation has uh, chosen to go all in 100% to, to serve uh, those that are in need, those refugees that are just pouring into Poland. And so, Lord, I pray that you continue to uh, strengthen them. I know everyone is so tired, Lord, and I pray you would give them energy and strengthen them for the work that continues. Lord, I pray that you would continue to help them uh, and by providing in creative ways uh, for their needs. Lord, I thank you for uh, all the, the churches in Poland who are stepping up and, and serving in such incredible ways. And, and Lord, I pray for the refugees and uh, Lord, those families that have been separated, those families that have left their homes, that have lost so much. And uh, Lord, I pray your blessing on them and, and Lord, that this war would end and that they would be able to go home and, and be reunited with their family. Uh, Lord, thank you uh, for brothers and sisters in Christ uh, that, that we know and love and can serve with all around the world. And thank you, Lord, for being the one that, that connects us all together. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's thank Adam again. Good morning, church. Awesome. It's so awesome to hear. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. Oh, my water from last time, huh? All right. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's so awesome to hear just a glimpse of uh, our friend's ministry in Poland. It's so awesome. Um, we're in the middle of this story called Glimpses, and we get to hear a little bit about what Christ is doing overseas. And um, yeah, I know we all are going to be praying for that ministry, praying for all uh, who are doing ministry overseas. Um, and we're just so glad you're here, and we get to hear a little bit about what God is doing through you. Um, so my name is Davis Ellenberger. I'm the youth minister here at Fairmount. Uh, if you don't know me, it's awesome. I get to preach in here every now and then, and it's, it's a big upgrade, right, from the gym down there. I know y'all are y'all pretty far removed from when we used to have services down in the gym, uh, but it's awesome being over here. Uh, and I'm so excited to be a part of this sermon series on glimpses. Uh, yeah, glimpses is all about, we're talking about how we see glimpses of Jesus Christ all throughout the Old Testament. 
Uh, we just finished a series in the youth ministry uh, last week, actually, uh, called Forever One. And it was just a series on pretty much all of Scripture and how it is one story for all time. It's forever one story about God's love for us, God's message for his people, um, and how he wants to bring us back into a relationship with him. Um, and ultimately, that's through Jesus. So when I was thinking about glimpses and how we see glimpses of Jesus through Old Testament characters, I was reminded of, uh, well, first of all, a glimpse. I looked up the definition, and it's a momentary or a partial view, right? A momentary or partial view of a bigger thing that you may not be able to see or comprehend completely, right? And I was reminded of one of my favorite verses in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which you may recognize as the love chapter, right? But down in verse 12, after Paul has written out all of his ideas on love and what it should be to the church of Corinth, uh, he admits that what he sees now, he may only see a glimpse of what is whole. So that verse, it says, For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Right now, we see glimpses of Jesus everywhere. We saw glimpses of Jesus in the Old Testament, but at the end of the day, it's a glimpse, right? God uses imperfect people to display his love for us all the time. And those imperfect people, all these characters throughout the Old Testament we've been talking about, they are showing glimpses of the perfection of Christ, and that is what he is. He is God, uh, he is the living God, and he is perfect. So in all these different uh, just discussions on these glimpses from the Old Testament we see, everything is perfected in Jesus Christ. And that's an awesome promise. So today we are talking about how we see a glimpse of Jesus in Esau. Uh, so last week, if you were here, Bill talked about uh, the two twins, right? Uh, we have Jacob and Esau, right? The sons of Isaac and Rebekah, the grandsons of Abraham uh, and Sarah. Uh, and to talk about Esau, he's not talked about as much. And everything that we know about Esau kind of relies on Jacob, right? He was the chosen one. That was our, our topic last week. So imagine being the brother or the sister to the chosen one, right? And then there's you, the hairy one, right? That's what Esau literally means. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, uh, to recap a little bit about these brothers' lives, if you weren't here or aren't familiar, their story, like all of ours, starts at birth, right? Um, Jacob was on to the heel of his brother Esau uh, during birth, right? And that is where Jacob gets his name. If you look up the meaning of Jacob, it means supplanter, okay? And maybe you don't know what that word means. I didn't know what it means. I think the only time I've ever used that word is one time I was walking by a garden and there was a guy working there and he looked at me and nodded and I said, sup, planter? <laughs> All right, I'm going to be a dad soon. I'm working on my dad jokes, okay? So yeah, just, just laugh if it's, even if it's not funny. But uh, sup, planter. And I lived, with, I lived with Jacob Filliger for a while and he likes planting, so I don't know. Maybe I'm onto something there. Um, but sup, planter. What the word sup, planter really means is someone who seizes or takes control of what is not their own. Um, someone who usurps, right? So Esau, like I said, just means hairy, right? So we have the chosen one, the one who is going to grow and take and grow so much, and then we have Esau, the hairy one. Um, so <laughs> uh, Jacob, a lot of us know his relationship with Esau um, really got off to a rough start, right? He was clinging onto his heel at birth, and then later on in life, Esau, he was the hunter. He would go out, he would hunt. And there must be one day where he was out on a rough hunt. He was out for days hunting, and he comes back dead tired, uh, hungry. Literally, he thinks he's about to die. It must not have been a very successful hunt if he didn't have any food to cook himself. So he comes home, uh, and he sees Jacob cooking a pot of stew, right? And he decides, or Jacob decides to trick his brother or, you know, convince his brother, I will give you this pot of stew, a bowl of stew, if you give me your birthright. And that was a big deal back then. The firstborn... Uh, earned the birthright from the father, the bigger share of the inheritance, uh, and also the father's blessing. And that was a huge deal. So Jacob convinces Esau to trade his birthright for a bowl of soup. That was a big mistake in Esau's life. Uh, Jacob also had to go on and deceive his father, convincing him that he was his brother because uh, his, his father Isaac wouldn't have given it to him if he knew that it was Jacob. So he deceives, him with, deceives his father with the help of his mother, uh, and Jacob is given the birthright, Jacob is giving the blessing that was given to Abraham to be uh, just more numerous than the stars to keep growing, right? Uh, and then we see Jacob is sent out. He's sent out into uh, the world to grow. He's sent out to the land of his uncle Laban. Uh, and there he marries uh, Leah and Rachel. He works seven years each, 
for Laban to marry his daughters. And then he, uh, Laban, he was about to leave again, and Laban asked him to stick around because he, uh, sorry, Jacob had been doing so well with his flock. He had been increasing his flock and his wealth. So Laban begs Jacob to stick around for six more years and continue working for him. But there had to be a cost, right? Uh, he had already married two of his daughters. So Laban tells Jacob that he can name his price. He can name his, his wage, his payment. And Jacob says something interesting. He decides he's been working with the flock. And he decides to ask Laban to pay him and let him keep the flock that were speckled and the flock that were darker colored and all the other uh, lambs and sheep and uh, rams and all those things would stay in Laban's flock. So Laban must have thought that was a good idea because he accepts uh, that offer to pay him. And it's really interesting. In Genesis 30, there's this whole description of how uh, Jacob kind of selectively breeds the, the lamb so that his flock is so much stronger and growing so much more than the flock of Laban. So if anybody likes science or any of that stuff, there's some selective breeding in Genesis. Um, but that is just another way that Jacob stood true to his name, right? He was a supplanter. He was taking from Laban to increase his own flock, as that was God's will. Jacob eventually just overgrows. Um, he becomes too powerful for Laban's land. His brother, or Laban's sons are getting a little bit jealous of this cousin that's just come in and kind of taking control. He's like the man, um, the go-to guy around there. So Jacob is sent out to go back to his home country, right? And as we know, waiting for him back in his home, home country is Esau, and Jacob definitely knows that. So on his way back, some messengers come back to uh, Jacob with word that Esau is coming to greet him with 400 men. And we know that Jacob was pretty scared, right? He knows that he just stole his brother's birthright. He's been gone for years. Uh, and now his brother hears, hears that he's coming back into town and he's sending 400 men with him to come and greet him. Jacob was pretty much ready for an attack, right? And we know that because Jacob decides to split up his family, his flock into two groups. He decided if, if Esau is going to come and attack me, maybe one group will survive if the other one is wiped out, right? Jacob is preparing for the worst. So Esau isn't spoken about nearly as much um, as his brother, the chosen one. And Esau didn't make a lot of great decisions in life, but we do see a glimpse of Jesus through Esau's interaction with Jacob to come. Through Esau, we see a glimpse of reconciliation Jesus provides us to God. And that word reconciliation is important. To, to reconcile means to make right. Uh, Jacob and Esau's relationship was broken. It needed to be made right, um, to be made whole, or else there would be a uh, war, right? Let's pray, uh, before we hi excuse me. Let's pray before we dive into today's word. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for um, this morning. We just thank you for your word, that it speaks true, that um, there are glimpses of just the, our Savior all throughout Scripture. Um, Lord, I just pray that we could just set aside any distractions, um, whether it's in our minds or just uh, present with us today. I just pray that we would just tune in, um, be at peace for the next few moments, and listen to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so our main Scripture picks up in Genesis chapter 33 and verses 1 through 4. It says, Jacob looked up, and there was Esau coming with his 400 men. So he divided his children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. He put the maidservant and their children in the front, Leah and her children next, and Rachel and Joseph in the rear. He himself went on ahead and bowed down to the ground seven times as he approached his brother. And I know there's a little spoiler up there, but let's pretend, let's just suspend our disbelief and uh, um, let's put ourselves in Jacob's shoes, okay? He's coming, uh, to meet his brother, assuming that he is so angry and furious and he's coming to seek revenge. And when I read this, this gave me a little bit of flashback to this one silly moment in college, um, but it was, it's just something I want to share with you. So there was a time um, where my roommates, my roommates and I, I lived with seven other guys, we were packed into this house, but we decided it would be a good idea to uh, grab some friends and drive to the Grand Canyon from Blacksburg, Virginia. So we did that. It was a 33-hour trip uh, in, the, in the van. We didn't stop to sleep or anything. We just kept switching drivers and drove straight to the Grand Canyon. Uh, and it was an awesome trip. I probably have a lifetime of sermon illustrations. I know the youth have heard a lot of uh, illustrations from, or a lot of stories from that trip. But there's this one moment that sticks out where we uh, were probably a little bit over halfway through this trip, and we come to this gas station to refuel. And my friend and I, we love Frisbee, right? So we decided to go out. And while everyone else is doing their thing, buying stuff inside, and we start tossing around a Frisbee just like this one, right? 
Um, so we're tossing it around, it's my friend Ryan and I, and Ryan and I start to, you know, we find this open space, we start to back up a little bit more, um, we find some room to throw to each other, and we start to get a little bit more bold, you know, we start to be like, pretend like we're quarterbacks and wide receivers and leading each other. Uh, and then there was one throw where I led Ryan a little bit too much, he couldn't quite catch up to the disc, and this disc sails right past Ryan, and then it sails into the open van doors, and it crushes my friend Tanner right in the mouth. <laughs> it was a little bit like this. <laughs> a little bit like that, yeah? <laughs> uh, Tanner wasn't expecting it at all. Uh, he was on his phone probably texting or something like that. And uh, yeah, he's furious, okay? So here's where the, the similarities start to kick in. We have Jacob about to meet his brother Esau. He's assuming that Esau is furious. I'm watching... Uh, Definitely furious Tanner scoot his way out of that van bench and then start walking me down. Uh, and I only had probably like seven seconds to talk him down or else, you know, he was, he was not the kind of guy to take that lightly. So he was coming for me. Uh, Jacob, thanks Esau, is coming for him. And I needed reconciliation quickly, right? Uh, Jacob needed reconciliation as well. Um, but the reality is all of us should be able to relate to that story because all of us are in dire need of reconciliation with God. We all need reconciliation with God. We need our relationship with God to be made right. So the story ended fine. He probably, I think Tanner was kind of, you know, not the nicest sometimes. He probably grabbed me in the, by the shirt and said something like, I'll break your knees if you let it happen again or something. But um, I, I got out of that hole. Uh, Ryan and I didn't play Frisbee anymore that trip. Um, but it was awesome. He stood next to me at my wedding, so there's no hard feelings or anything like that. Um, but yeah, we should all be able to re relate to that because we all need reconciliation. So let's see how Esau responds to Jacob now. It says, But Esau ran to meet Jacob and embraced him. He threw his arms around his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Esau offered his brother undeserved forgiveness. There was nothing that Jacob did to deserve what happened to him, um, to deserve that forgiveness and reconciliation that his brother gave to him. It was a free gift, um, totally unexpected. So we are all in need of that same reconciliation with God. So there's three main things I want us to take away from this little uh, kind of experience that Jacob had with his brother. Three glimpses, uh, or three things that we can take away from this glimpse of Jesus that we see in Esau and his forgiveness for his brother. The first is that we have a big problem, and our big problem is that we have made ourselves enemies of God. That's the, that's the reason we need reconciliation in the first place. Every single person in this room who's ever been on the stage has made themselves an enemy of God. We all need to be uh, rectified with God. We need reconciliation, right? Colossians 1.21 says, Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. If there's one thing I wouldn't want to be labeled, it's an enemy of God, right? But that's the reality of what sin does to our lives, to our relationship with God. This room, you know, we, we would probably all consider ourselves good people, but we still need to be forgiven of the sins in our lives. Romans 3.23 states it clearly that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that's the reality of our humanity, of our sinful nature. So it's a big problem, and it's everybody's problem, and it's a problem that we cannot fix on our own. I know so many people want to fix all their problems, and something pops up, they want to get it done, and um, you know, they, they want to take care of it. But it's a problem that we can't fix on our own. We have to ask for help. We can't be good enough. We can't say the right things to the right people. We can't pay enough money. We can't talk to somebody's manager. Um, it's a problem that we all have, and we cannot fix it on our own. The penalty of this problem is the bigger problem itself, right? The penalty of our sins is eternal separation from God. If you think that's a big problem, uh, turn to your neighbor really quick and say, that's a big problem. <laughs> so we can't hope to fix it on our own, but the good news is that God loves us so much, he loves us too much to allow us to stay apart from him. God gives us a solution. And that's the second takeaway, is God's big solution is Jesus makes, a pe makes peace between us and God. Romans 5, 10, and 11, it says, For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. When we were far away, God made a way for us to come back to him. When we turned our backs on God, God turned us around. 
When we were walking in darkness, when we were choosing to walk in darkness, God showed us light. We had a big problem that we couldn't solve on our own, but God has a bigger solution, and that solution is Jesus Christ. As this verse said, Christ died for us. That's how we receive reconciliation, but even more so, we are reconciled through his life. He didn't just die and remain dead. He died and he rose again. That's what we're going to remember soon in our time of communion, his death and his resurrection and what that does to our life. And what it does is it reconciles us to God. Romans 6.23, that's one of my favorite verses of the example of, um, that, that exemplifies the problem that we have and God's solution. Romans 6.23, there's kind of two halves to it. The first half says, uh, for the wages of sin is death, right? Everyone's familiar with wages. It's what you earn for the things that you do. The wages of our sin is death, and not just death one time, an eternal separation. But the good news is that's not where God leaves it, right? There's a second half to that verse, and that is, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We earn death through our, our sin, but God gives us the free gift of eternal life freely through Christ Jesus. It's like a gift under a Christmas tree, right? Um, it's free to you, but only if you accept it. And that's what the forgiveness and the reconciliation that Christ offers us is. It's a free gift that we have to accept in our hearts. So I also want to take a little bit of time. I know we've been talking a lot about the forgiveness that we receive from God, and that's great, but I also want to talk a little bit about how that forgiveness that we receive from God is meant to be shared and extended to those around us. That's not always our favorite thing to talk about. You know, we love talking about, oh, forgiveness for me, um, but it's tough thinking about forgiveness for everybody else. We've all said this before, um, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, right? That's part of the Lord's Prayer. That's how Jesus taught us to pray. And sometimes we really struggle with that second half. I think maybe sometimes people mumble it, you know, when we're saying that, um, because they, we don't really want to forgive, those, uh, to forgive those who have wronged us, right? It doesn't say forgive us as we forgive our family or forgive us as we forgive our friends. It's forgive us as we forgive anyone who has wronged us in the past. So forgiving others is tough, right? But we are called to forgive just as Jesus forgave us. I think sometimes the biggest problem that we have with forgiving others is that we look at others the way that the world looks at them and not the way that Christ looks at them, right? The world looks at others who have wronged you and they say you need to get revenge, you need to ignore them, you need to get even, or maybe you need to make them beg for your forgiveness. But luckily, that is not how Jesus views us when we have turned our backs on him. That's not how Jesus looks at you. One of Jesus' followers also had this, this trouble with just imagining how much forgiveness should we give to other people. And this comes in Matthew chapter 18, verse 21, if you'd like to follow along. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, How many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. So let's break that down for a second. Peter comes up to Jesus, and he probably thinks, you know, oh, I have a pretty good point. Jesus will agree with me. Seven times is a lot to forgive someone who's wronged you, right? A lot of people would probably get tired after the second or third time forgiving someone. Um, I know I might, but Jesus tells him, try again. Try 77 times, not seven times. Multiply it by 10. And I don't think that Jesus is telling us we need to keep a tally, okay? I don't want to see anybody a couple weeks from now, you know, in the hallway arguing with, you know, husband and wife, and then the husband breaks out a notepad and says, okay, I'll forgive you this time, but you're at 16. Um, that's not what Jesus is saying. I think his point is when you feel like you've forgiven enough, when you feel like you've you reached your limit, multiply it by 10 and keep forgiving. There's never a time where someone doesn't deserve our forgiveness because God, Jesus, has freed us from our sin. All right, so let's continue uh, in Matthew chapter 18, because this question from Peter leads Jesus into one of, uh, I think, the most impactful parables that he told, and it's the parable of the unmerciful servant. So Jesus says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. So 10,000 bags of gold, um, your Bible might say, but a, a bag of gold kind of represents a talent. And talents back then were 20 years of work. Uh, it took 20 years of work to pay off one talent. And this man owes 10,000 talents, okay? 
This is an unpayable debt. If you translate it to money nowadays, it's about $3.4 billion, okay? So I don't know if any of us can even imagine. I don't know how a servant got in that much debt, but this is an unpayable debt that would take 200,000 years if he were to, to pay it off normally, right? So the servant is under an unpayable debt. At this time, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But then when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. And that's a, that's a pretty uh, bold story, right? I think we can all agree that what the unmerciful servant did was horrible. He was just forgiven this unpayable, massive debt, unimaginable debt. And then he turns around and he persecutes his fellow um, servant for mere pennies on the dollar, right, from what he owed. And in reality, that's what we all do, right? Sometimes in our lives when we harbor bitterness in our hearts toward our, our neighbors, instead of freely offering forgiveness, we're doing the same exact thing as that unmerciful servant. We choose to be freed from our unpayable debt of sin from Jesus, but then we're, we're keeping keep people accountable in our lives for pennies. So, we are called to forgive as Jesus forgave us. And I know sometimes talking about forgiving others, there are people in this room that have been hurt. There are people in this room that maybe have been hurt more than I can even explain by what people have done to them or what people have said to them. And I want you to know that, that we're with you, right? Um, your church family is with you. If you need someone to talk to, um, talk to a minister here. If you need other help, um, we would love to just point you to a godly resource, a professional that can help you through some of the pain that you've experienced. I know Forgiveness is not always as easy as flipping a switch and saying it's forgiven, right? There is some pain in the room, um, but we are here with you, and ultimately Jesus is with you, right? Jesus has paid the unpayable debt of all the sins of the world. Um, we can pay, or we can offer that same forgiveness to others if we trust in him. So I want you to know that whatever has been done to you does not define you. Your past does not define you. What has been done to you does not define you because you are a child of the Most High God, you are holy and dearly loved. You belong to him. You are his child, and your identity is in Christ. The third takeaway um, from this glimpse between Esau and Jacob that we can take away is the big picture. Our reconciliation to God is a homecoming. One of the best pictures that we get of this idea um, of a homecoming is another parable called the parable of the prodigal son. Um, so in this parable, just to summarize it really quick, I'm sure we all are familiar, but this man has two sons and his younger son decides that he's ready for the inheritance, that he basically wishes his father was dead, he wants the things of the father and not the father, and he goes and he takes all of the father's you know, possessions that he got from the inheritance and he, uh, he wastes it on, on, li on um, just frivolous living, right? He lives lavishly, but then it's gone, right? It only lasts for a moment and then it's gone. And as we know, the servant, or sorry, the younger brother finds himself in a rough spot. He's scooping pig slop to the pigs, and he's even begging that he could eat that pig slop because he's in such a rough space. He has nothing. He's completely distant from the father. But he remembers the father, right? He remembers the father. He remembers the home where he belongs. Uh, and he decides to go back and maybe beg to just work as a servant. But while he was still a long way off, this is where Luke chapter 15, verse 20 um, comes in. While the son was still a long way off, his father saw him, and he was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. This is how our father feels about us. Um, he wants us to come home dearly, and he's waiting for us to come home. We can always go back home. No matter how far away we feel, no matter how distant we are, no matter how far we've drifted, maybe in our faith or our walk with Christ, we can always go back home, and God is waiting there with open arms. When we choose to go back home, we are always welcome. That's why Jesus came into this world, right? Jesus came into this world to reconcile us so that we can enter into that relationship with the Father like it was meant to be. Jesus came into this world um, so we could go home. God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son, he sent Jesus into this world, not so that we would die, but so that we could have eternal life if we believe in him. 
right? He sent his son not to condemn us, but to save the world through him. So the last truth, um, as the band comes out to close us out, the last truth that I want to share with you is this. Reconciliation with God restores our relationship with God. It's a complete restoration. Maybe there's different groups of people in this room. Maybe you feel like you are distant from God. Maybe you feel like your relationship with God hasn't been quite right. It needs to be restored. Maybe you've never made the decision to make Jesus Christ your Savior. Maybe you've never decided to walk in the light with him. Um, Maybe you feel like you can't go home. Maybe you feel like what you've done or what you've said um, kind of disqualifies you from going home. But I want you to know that that is not true. You are always welcome home because you have been reconciled through Jesus Christ. There also may be people that you need to ask for forgiveness. You need to ask for forgiveness maybe for the things you've done or some of the things you've said. And you can always do that, right? You have to lean on Jesus and he will help you through that process of forgiveness. And then maybe we need to ask Jesus for the strength to forgive others. Maybe someone has wronged us. Maybe someone has hurt us. Um, Maybe think about that person in your head as we go into our time of communion. Who is that person that needs to be forgiven, that you need to extend the forgiveness of Jesus Christ to them? I want everyone to know that wherever you stand, Jesus has already done the work. He has already restored us. His death and his resurrection has already reconciled us to God. We just have to accept that free gift. Through his death and resurrection, he has given, he has uh, forgiven any sin that has happened in our life, any sin that you have ever committed, and he's also reconciled any sin that you could ever commit, um, and it's all through Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word. I just thank you so much for just the glimpses of Jesus that we get to see all throughout scripture. We just thank you for your love for us, that you would send him, um, that you would send him to die and raise again so that we could live. Um, Lord, I just pray that we would all take a hold of that forgiveness that you give us through Jesus Christ, and we could extend that into the world around us this week. We love you so much. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There's a lot going on after a message like that. A lot of things to think about, a lot of things to decide. And we want you to know that this time is a time for you to respond. And if you're not a believer and you decide to, you know, today's the day, I get it. I totally understand. We would love for you to come forward and talk with us about that anytime before the service, after the service, Tuesday, whenever. The invitation is never closed. It's always open. But you also have an opportunity to make a decision right where you sit right now. Make a decision to follow well, to allow yourself to be led by Jesus. And that's something that we are all able to do. And in addition to that, we get to respond in a way that is so meaningful to us here at Fairmount. We commune every single week, and we do it because we think it's important. In Scripture, when Jesus was gathered around the table with his disciples, and it was just a little bit before he was going to be betrayed, these are the words that he said to us. Listen to this from 1 Corinthians. That the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, he took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body which is for you do this in remembrance of me and in the same way he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup you proclaim the lord's death until he comes and that's what we do now we proclaim the lord's death until he returns Um, and we all get to go back. Take a moment, commune with God, commune with one another, break your bread, share it with your family member, go to God in communion, um, and we will take just a a pause, a time of reflection now uh, before we continue to sing and head out of this place today. So take a few moments.
that's fine. Some of you are going to continue to commune, can carry on. We're going to begin a song that we want you, when you are ready, to, to stand with us and join with us as we sing this, as we continue to worship the things that we do as we lead worship is we try to figure out the order of the songs that we do stuff in because when you do a communion song it kind of comes down and you're thank you 
and you walk out somberly into the car and you go away. We decided we did not want you walking out somberly today. So we want to do one more song. Stick with us. It's going to be a load of fun. We've had a blast working this up. And, um, and let's celebrate before we walk out of here today, shall we? So uh, I've played a thousand songs in front of thousands of people, but I've never sang one song to the person that needs it the most, which is my savior. So. Glory, glory, I've been singing since I laid Thank you.